Blink? Mondo asked, grabbing at its eyes. My sister has this doll that blinks. Oh, oops. Mondo turned to us, grinning. There were shallow indents in the wax where the doll's eyes had been. Oh shit, Gus shook his head. You gotta put those back in. I can't. The little threads broke. He held them out to show us the eyes, two grape-sized balls of glass. Intense pinks were filtering through the autumn mesh of the oak. Sunset meant the park was officially closed. Seriously, Mondo asked. Anybody got glue or something? A firefly was lighting up the airless caves of the doll's nostrils, undetected by the doll. Oh, you're even blinder now, I thought, and a heavy feeling draped over me. Mondo seemed to be catching on. Don't we know this kid? He stood on his toes and peered into the scarecrow's eyes with a shrewdness that you did not ordinarily expect from Mondo Chu, who was encased in a baby fat that he could not age out of, with big slabby cheeks that squeezed his eyes into a narcoleptic squint. There was some evidence that Mondo did not have the happiest home life. Mondo was half Chinese, half something. We'd all forgotten, assuming we'd ever known. Don't say it, I thought. Oh, Mondo fell back on his heels. It's Eric. Oh. I took a backward step myself. Juan Carlos paused with one hand inside the doll's back, still wearing a doctor's distant, guileful expression. Who the fuck is Eric? Gus snarled. Don't you assholes remember him? Mondo was grinning at us like a Jeopardy champion. He shook the doll's hand into thin air. Eric Eunice. Thank you. arbiter. He doesn't question his own judgment ever. You know, it's sort of, he's the ultimate authority. So I do, I do love um, unreliable narrators because they seem like the most honest narrators in a sense. You know, they're acknowledging uh, how difficult it is to get a beat on what's really going on most of the time. Um, the potpourri of influences you were quoting from Ben Marcus to Italo Colino to everything that also ranks I have great posts like Wallace Stevens. Where do they come in, in these kind of stories? Oh, that's, uh, that was a really great list. Those are all my, those are all um, our favorites, I think. Wallace Stevens was a huge influence on me. And talk about uh, someone who is not afraid to um, use strangeness to talk about what it feels like to be alive. You know, I think um, what he did for me, I, I read him first in college, and I didn't understand you know, it was the idea of order in QS, I just didn't understand it. I love the sound of it and sort of the, the, the role of it and the music of it, but it was, it was not, I, I, it was like a riddle that I couldn't solve. And that was the first time a professor had ever said to me, no, I don't know what it means either. I just love it. And so the idea that you could stand under this waterfall of language and that there could be some meaning that still eludes you and maybe even mm -hmm. eludes the author, that was really, um, that was really important. Um, what about it was today for you? Is it different? Do you understand the idea of who was better now? I think I have my own ideas. You know, I graph my own experience onto it. But there is something that's still elusive and um, and kind of unsayable. You know, there's some inarticulable thing happen that happens when I read it. And I think that's what makes it valuable to me, too. You pick this story for tonight, though. There's others like Wheeling for the Empire that could have brought us to Japan and an overmill in which the factory doors are slowly transforming to a breed a sort of white-furred mutant mice, if I get it right. <laughs> um, when you're compiling a story collection like Vampires and Dunham Grove, do you compile it with the idea of the whole in mind, or do you write the stories one after another in order to have something as a whole 
I think I think it's a little bit of both. A lot of these stories were sort of already half of them. I would say were already published when we got the idea to make a collection. But there were a lot that were leaving out of this one. I think the first collection I did, it was just anything I had written up to that point. I was like, oh, here you go, <laughs> in a hefty sack. And this one felt a little more deliberate. I really wanted, um, I ended up kind of orbiting these same themes. So you mentioned you know, the, the unreliable narrators. I, I think a lot of the stories end up being about storytelling. So you mentioned really for the umpires, this story where these, these girls turn into silkworm monsters, strange white for silkworm monsters during the Industrial Revolution. Um, but for me, that one somehow ended up being, feeling really similar to this story, in it, 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 the, the heart of it, anyway, underneath the, the plot mechanics, which is just, um, how do you tell a story so that you can move forward? How do you tell a story so that you don't get lost in the past or stuck in traumatic repetition? I think that Larry Rubio is very much struggling with that in this story. How do I deal with what I did in the past without becoming traumatized myself? How do I atone for it and move forward? Uh, there's another story, The Hawks of the Window, which is set in Nebraska. And in this sort of is this sort of preparatory work for your upcoming Dust Bowl novel, which your sister ironically labeled as uh, Dryland yet. <laughs> My sister is like, you have to stop repeating that joke to people, but it's true. She, I wrote this book, Swamplandia, and then in like a giant overcorrection, I'm now writing this book about the Dust Bowl drought, which she calls Drylandia. Um, I, yes, and this, there's a Dust Bowl story there that's like an outtake that I don't think is going to make it into the novel. It's sort of pre-Dust Bowl, and it's about these, these people on the prairie to prove up. They would have to have these sod homes and live on, the, live on the estate for a certain amount of time. And one of the insane requirements was that they also had a little glass window. So I had read somewhere this, this um, just this tiny kind of trip, trip, bit of trivia about uh, there would be a glass window that everyone swapped around in the community when the inspector came. And so in this, this story, I think, is very much about what happens when um, these homesteaders are confronted with a really terrible reality and still clinging to the, this, this myth or this desire um, that, 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 it, that they're, they're going to stay at any price, and the price is higher and higher. Let's turn to you both now in our final. Come on. Yeah. Fiona, one of the tweets says, um, turns out Germany is German. What do you mean by that? Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> You've gone deep. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, uh, gee, I, I don't remember the context for, for, for the, the tweet. Perhaps it had I, no context. I, 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 don't know, I, don't know I don't know what that meant. I don't know what that meant. I have been having a wonderful time in Germany. Perhaps I should offer that up as a caveat that never comes out of my mouth next. I have been actually astonished by the um, sausage consumption, and so I might have been responding to that in a kind of <laughs> very loving, glib kind of kind of way. But I, I've been here a month and actually been having just about the time of my life, so I'm sure I, I meant the best. Kara, as you are living in a splendid American isolation at the American Academy, have you met any Germans so far at all? <laughs> Where are they? It's perfect. I must speak perfect German because I understand everything around me. Um, no, I actually haven't. I'm so excited. They're bouncing me from this beautiful castle where I live on the Monte, but I'm going to be down at Gerlitz or Van Hoff, so it's going to be a big scene change, I think, for the rest of the summer. And I have had the pleasure to meet um, uh, a lot of young German writers, translators, it's been wonderful to be here. Both of you have been teaching or are teaching at various universities and colleges like NYU and Bard. Um, first of all, how do the German students in Nazi compare to the Americans? I'm so embarrassed to say I think they're better, actually. Really? Yeah, I'm going to tweet that to America. Yeah, that'd yeah, be great. It's one way to get me hired back in the States. You'd um, be the first one to say this. My students here, I mean, first of all, their, their fluency with English is astonishing to me. They speak. They understand the text that we are reading better than my American students, which I really find, uh, I don't even know what to say about that. They're very engaged, they're very motivated, they're excited to be reading American literature. I'm teaching a seminar right now with sort of contemporary, somewhat experimental American fiction, and this has a lot of them excited. And, you know, we're reading a, a novel now called The Hundred Brothers by Donald Angel, which is extremely complicated. Syntactically, I read it, and I, what is going on in this novel? And I don't know what I was thinking when I signed it to them. And then they come into class and they're like, well, this is what's happening. And I'm like, really? Oh, okay. You know, they're teaching me. Did so, they know about Donald Ashton before? No. No, no. I think um, he's really an American prize. 
but um, I'm trying to do my best to export some of the weirder aspects of contemporary American culture because